I was just going to say, don't ever, exactly don't right. ever leave anything near take, Kenny. Uh -huh. right here, let me see what mine look like. I walked out of the country club wearing some guy's jacket and had the guy's keys in the pocket. That was a, that was a nice jacket. True story. Was nice and nice. A little bit. Oh, I don't drink water on these things. Letter of transmittal. I'll clean the air. <laughs> one minute. Give me one minute. You couldn't read because it was silent. Yeah. <laughs> I prefer the paper copies anyway, because I know that I'm probably old fashioned. No, I like them for I some things because I want to write notes on them. I write them notes. notes. I can't. I can't. I do too. It was hard to format that too if you really yeah. wanted it out. Yeah. It kept going sideways yeah. on me. I'm like, hey, nobody got time for this. Yeah. So, I'll, make it I'll, I'll review it. I'll make a decision. I never saw him before. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do I need to know anything? He's the only face in the last time. Oh. Oh. Uh, Matthew, good to see you. What is it? Minus 2% you're coming we'll in with today? Afterwards afterwards. Minus 4? Oh, uh, there we go. Right. Two, seven, two, six. You're in. No, what? Do you want yeah, to get other people to come in? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. After we get done here. Yeah. Um, it's not past like that. Press release for that. There's no vote. Sure. I've got a lot of work. Okay, did Tony put it here? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Good evening, everyone. Very nice to be here with you this evening. Um, this evening, we'll be presenting the board approved uh, budget for fiscal year 2019 2020. Um, and again, with this presentation, this is a condensed version of the presentation that was um, given to the board. Uh, just want to clue you into the fact the uh, photos, those photos all tell a story. Um, photo number one there I actually shot from the mezzanine at Wethersfield High School at the holiday concert. That is our choral airs, our uh, concert choir, and our chamber choir all together. It was an absolutely stunning event. Um, a lot of talent on display there. And the process of the budget, well, this is what it's all about. It's all about the kids, and it's all about providing high-quality services and programs for our students. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, you all received the full line-by-line -line itemized budget, but we'll go through this. On the next page, we have our approved 2018-19 budget for $58,728,469. Our proposed 2019-20 budget is $57,159,339, which is in an amount of decrease of $1,569,130, which is a percentage de decrease of 2.67%. So let's break the numbers down. As you know, um, we've embarked upon shared services for the operations and maintenance, including custodial and maintenance, and this um, has changed the budget uh, process for the Board of Education. So what we've seen here that's gone over to the town side with custodial and maintenance programs along with utilities, that's $4,336,810. The asterisk there is um, certainly it's kind of an up in the air um, as Sally will be going through the number lines now as she's taken over as director of physical services that number certainly may be adjusted from the town budget one of the things that we'll be taking on is the crossing guard um, salaries that has happened this year even though it's in the town budget we are um, actually uh, in the process of, of paying the uh, crossing guards they are part of the Board of Education um, structure now in addition to that uh, through conversation with uh, Mr. Martino, we have also added in the potential legislative mandate, the TRB contribution, $249,606. In the event, let's say, for example, that we did not move the custodial and maintenance over, or we, and we kept the utilities, and added these items in, we would be at an increase of $2,337,703, or a percentage increase of 3.98% over the current budget. One thing to note, over the past five years, the Weathersfield Public Schools um, have averaged an increase of 2.0 for, um, excuse me, let me say it again, 2.04% over the past five years in terms of its increases. The majority of the increases are really based upon contractual um, obligations, mandates, and benefits, and you'll see that a little bit later on. Okay, so here's our contractual mandated drivers, which increases over our total 18-19 approved budget. First is the Weathersfield Federation of Teachers contractual increases, which is, you see, is $764,871, or a 1.30% increase. All other contractual increases net $204,084, or 0.35% increase. Our benefits, excluding custodial and maintenance program, is $478,949, or 0.82%. Required licenses, leases, and software total $405,129, or 0.76% increase. So that's like the lease on our transition academy, our copiers, our Raptor system, um, our IEP system, and MUNIS. Um, our transportation is $154,589, or 0.26%, and special education tuition and related services, $51,755, or 0.09%. So the selected contractual mandated budget drivers total $2,104,377, or 3.58% increase over the total 2018-19 approved budget. So 
So taking a look at the breakdown, you can see, and um, this is typical, we see this every year, we have approximately 81% of our budget is taken up by salaries and benefits. And here's the historical salary and benefits. One thing I would uh, <clears throat> have you look at for the 1920 budget, if you'll notice, uh, with regard to personal services and benefits, you see we went from 14.87% uh, in 1819 up to 16.32% for 1920, and that is um, indicative of the uh, addition of the TRB contribution. The TRB contribution over the course of time is expected to go up, so for next year we're projecting 249,000 uh, and change. Beyond that, two years out, we're looking at about 512,000, and then beyond that we project out to upwards of about 750,000. So, um, as you know, that is not etched in stone at this point in time. That's still a proposal, but um, again, through conversation that we've had with um, council leadership, um, it was suggested that we put it in there as a placeholder, and we have done so. And then the non-salary accounts, one of the things I would uh, highlight, if you take a look at uh, property going from the 4.63% down to 2.15%, that is uh, supplies and utilities. So um, natural gas, water, sewer, all coming out of the board budget, heading over to the town budget. Okay, I like this visual graph. Our 2019-20 changes by major object. Personal services and benefits, as you can tell, the increase was $599,150. Our property, which is basically our Chromebooks, which you'll see later on, um, and you can see in your budget line items, $257,774. Other purchase services, $181,448, which is our transportation. Again, you'll see that in about slide 16. Miscellaneous is a, um, in the red items here, $5,931. Professional and technical services, which is $81,215, and you'll see that later on with more details. Personal services, salaries, $473,960, that's custodial and maintenance. Purchase property service, $559,583, again, custodial and service maintenance. And supplies, $1,486,813, and that's from the utilities changeover. You know, each year we talk about uh, the process of building the budget, and this budget is not built. Do you see somebody up there you know? Uh, yes, I, do. Thank you, sir. I thought so. <laughs> that was their uh, visit to uh, Better Connecticut. So um, the uh, request not included in the budget. I want to talk a little bit about that because each year we build a budget and we never build it in isolation. So we take into account requests of uh, staff members, our principals, and um, our program directors across the district. And oftentimes we have items that are requested that don't make it into the budget. We're keenly aware of the fact that times are tight, certainly at the state capitol. Having been at the legislative office building last week, I can see that firsthand. So we have to balance. You know, it would be nice to have all of the things you want, but you have to balance with the realities of the um, fiscal constraints we have. So one of the requests that was uh, submitted by the elementary principals, of course, was certified media specialists at each school. Um, we'd love to be able to provide that as we move closer and closer to one-to-one -to -one across the entire district. But the reality of it, to move from those um, media specialists who are uncertified now in the para union to go up to a certified teacher, the cost is just unfortunately too prohibitive. Okay, other requests <coughs> not meant in the budget, and if you look at this picture, the, the man in the center there is Sheik Emmett. Um, our middle school increased psychologists from 3.5 days to 5 days per week was eliminated. Increased main office clerk position from 0.5, which is a full-time equivalent, to 1.0. In the district and BOE requests, 1.0 for our ELL teacher um, at Hamner, 1.0 for our special services supervisor, and at the high school, 
1.0 for our technology education teacher, 1.0 for dean of students, and 1.0 for SRBI math tutor. And South Dean Middle School and the Weathersville High School are virtual reality equipment and software. Um, wanted to add workstations at South Dean Middle School and add Google Expe Expeditions at the Weathersfield High School. One of the things I think it's important to mention before we move on to the next slide is we've really worked hard um, to do more with less and I want to talk a little bit about the English language learner component. One of the things we've been able to do over the past couple years in lieu of coming before council and requesting additional funding, what we've looked to do is we've looked to reallocate the funding that we have, whether it be grant funding or funding for tutors. And we have reallocated that money to go from a non-certified tutor to two certified ELL teachers. At last count, as of this morning, Wethersfield Public Schools currently has 343 English language learners enrolled in our system. So we're fortunate now with the additional ELL teachers we've been able to get through our reallocation of funding. We're providing direct services to students um, now at Emerson Williams Elementary School as well as Charles Wright. Mayor? No, that, that's me. you take that one off. This one's me. One. All right, so the professional services, the drivers. Here's where we're at. With regard to the special uh, services supervisor, this is one of those non-negotiables. Um, the state mandates what we can and cannot spend in terms of grant funding, and there's only a certain percentage that we can end up funding through the uh, IDEA grant. So as a result, we have to shift 0.32 of an FTE from the grant over into the operating budget. That's 51,791. Uh, as Bobby mentioned earlier, the WFT contractual and step increases we have that there. In terms of our projected retirement, right now I'm projecting four retirements for the Weathersfield Public Schools. That is always a nebulous number. We may get a couple more before the year is out, but right now we're budgeting for four. And that savings is the result of bringing in staff members at a lower contractual rate than the teachers that have gone out uh, to retire. And again, the other positions that we have to make sure that we retain, the Weathersfield Career Coordinator, that position is partially grant funded. Uh, that individual supports our students at the Weathersfield Transition Academy as well as supporting the hard work that's going on in terms of career development at the high school. That position was gained by savings that we had from a maternity leave that was a year long. So that maternity leave will be ending. We anticipate that teacher will be coming back. So that's something we need to look at. In addition to that, we have our ABA and STRIVE program. Um, we've got a slide a little later on that we'll show you where we have um, gained some tremendous success with these in-house programs in terms of saving money and having cost avoidance. I also want to talk about uh, lunch aids. One of the things we were able to do with our cafeteria fund, we have very limited use for that. It's very tight in terms of auditors and how we can use it. We did get word from the state that we can utilize our cafeteria fund to pay lunch aids. So we've reduced the budget and moved the lunch aids over to the cafeteria fund. And again, retaining our non-bargaining positions. This is a BCBA. BCBA is a board certified behavior analyst. This individual supports our students in our ABA, Applied Behavior Analyst Program, as well as our STRIVE program at the elementary level. In addition to that, we use the BCBA throughout the district for students that are exhibiting difficult and challenging behavior. And then again with OT, that's a mandate that we're providing uh, occupational therapy services for our students through IEPs. Also, um, want to talk a little bit about the coaching stipends for lacrosse. You've heard about lacrosse before. This has been a process um, that has been in the works for the past couple years. Uh, last year and this year, we were able to develop a club lacrosse program through partnership with parents. Pay to play, um, parents providing support for uh, equipment, and uh, the district providing support for coaches and field time. We have enough students where we have four full teams, two girls and two boys. So the expectation for next year is we'd have a junior varsity and varsity program both for the boys and the girls. So Mr. Maltesi reports that the numbers continue to be huge. And again, the work that you did with um, replacing Catone Field, all of the lines are sewn in. We've got the nets up in place already. Again, it was good thinking. And we've had a tremendous amount of, of um, student response uh, for this program. 
And then again, we have all other contractual and step increases within our other bargaining units, which accounts for $204,084. Okay, Michael mentioned our ABA and STRIVE program, and this started quite a few years ago um, with a philosophy that we wanted our children to stay here. Um, many special ed children are outplaced, um, and not only are they not part of the community, but it also is a very expensive piece of our budget. So let me explain this to you. ABA is Applied Behavioral Analysis, and this is therapy for autistic children. And I'll go down, if you follow the green area down. In 2019-20 program, the cost was $381,825. Realized savings came from two children coming back into the system. So that's $252,700. Cost avoidance is that we didn't outplace eight students. So that's $712,752 for our net margin of $583,627. Um, and again, our focus in the STRIVE program is to keep our children here in the system. Um, this is a program in which there is trauma in the children's background. So in our 2019-20 program cost, it was $191,623. We had one student come back, so that's $55,827. Three were not outplaced, so that's a savings of $182,193 $2 for a net margin of $46,397. And I have to say, this is so successful in a short period of time. In terms of our personal services, again, more of the budget drivers, many of these are mandates. Uh, the OPEB contribution, this is an annual uh, increase, $78,000 over uh, last year. Right now, we're talking about a 6% increase in the defined benefit pension plan, 36,068. Health insurance, and again, the health insurance number, you know, it, is, it tends to be all over the place. And right now, the latest that I've heard is it's actually increasing. That is not typical. It's not what we, we've seen. Typically, we've seen it go down. So right now, we have it budgeted at a 9% increase. Medicare Part B, reimbursement to eligible retirees, 41,155. That's a contractual obligation. We have a 7.5% increase for workers' comp. And then, again, we've put in as a placeholder here the potential legislative mandate for the TRB contribution, 249,606. Okay. <clears throat> Purchase professional and technical services. These are drivers here. Reduction in professional development support, certain trainings and anticipated homebound tutoring consultations reduced $44,407. Increase in required SPED consultation services, $15,705. And shifting of custodial maintenance programs to the town is minus $28,313. As we continue to the next slide, let my tech person here do it. Purchase property service drivers. Custodial maintenance program shifting to the town budget. You can see their water and service, repairs and maintenance, and construction services. And rents and leases decrease due to elimination of one concurrent Chromebook lease of 441 units and replaced with a large purchase <coughs> under property. And this will be. Um, uh, given, you will be given details on page 18 later on in our slideshow um, how we've changed that up. And again, just some of the other purchased service drivers. Um, our contractual increase in transportation services, uh, you may uh, remember that we have entered into a uh, contract with Autumn Transportation after having a long history with uh, another uh, provider. We felt that uh, we were not getting the level of service that we were expecting, so we've gone with Autumn. Autumn has performed uh, quite admirably and uh, has done a great job of transporting our students safely. We have the increase in the special education and VOTEC transportation. Um, again, these are obligations that we have to provide our students if they are headed out to special ed programs. <clears throat> One of the things we do look at, though, is we look at the opportunity to share. You know, we talk about shared services and we talk about regionalization. So, I'll give you an example of a student that's attending an outplacement outside of Wethersfield. And my colleague in Rocky Hill also has a student that's attending the same school. 
So I got the call and, hey, I understand you have a student going to this school. I have one that's going out. Could we ride share? Absolutely. So we've got a ride share going on and that ride share will save both districts approximately $25,000. So we look wherever we can to find savings. The piece here with the athletic transportation provided by the contractor, um, as you know, we had our beloved uh, Weathersfield athletic buses. Um, they cost us an absolute fortune to maintain. Uh, we had three of them. One of them dated back, uh, I want to say it was like a 2004. They were extraordinarily expensive to maintain. We struggled to find drivers to um, drive the athletic routes. And we had the um, process of having to go to quarterly inspections that the state now mandated. And every time we take a bus in, there'd be something else that had to be fixed. So the cost of these buses just became too prohibitive. So we have sold them, and we're now utilizing Autumn to provide the athletic transportation. And then last but not least, certainly we have a decrease in postage and printing. We're going more toward online. You know, we're doing more and more with the website and with... Um, with school messenger, so the uh, mailed out items, the, the packets that parents used to get, everything's online at this point in time, so we've been able to see a nice decrease there. And then last but not least, the increase in tuition for state place students and SPED magnet services. That's one of those, it's always the wild card, special education costs across districts across the state are continuing to spiral out of control, which is one of the reasons why we looked to develop in-house programming to try and stem that cost. In terms of other supplies and drivers, again, the 5,320 aligns with the uh, materials for the lacrosse program. And then again, the custodial maintenance programs, these are all reductions in our budget. Maintenance supplies, custodial supplies, natural gas, and electricity. And we have been absolutely vexed by that electricity number, and one of the things that uh, Matt uh, Kazak, our business manager, has taken a look at is um, at Weathersfield High School, we seem to be utilizing a uh, different uh, service provider mm -hmm. and on a variable rate, and we're not quite sure why that is. So we're certainly looking into that one. So the variable rate at Weathersfield High School for the amount of time that that building is used, that's, that's trouble. So you can see why that number is going up. And in terms of property drivers, um, again, taking a look at maintaining our one-to-one -one Chromebook initiatives, the IT department's proposing the purchase of 1,441 Chromebooks to replace the lease of the 441 units with an additional 1,000 units to cycle inventory that is beyond useful life. This is interesting. When we first dove into the uh, Chromebooks and getting to that one-to-one, -one, we looked primarily at leases. And the reason we looked at leases is because the Chromebooks were better than $500 a unit. We're now able to get Chromebook units for barely $200 a unit. So now at this point in time, it really the idea of avoiding a three-year lease, purchasing this, and getting three to five years life out of these as opposed to the three-year lease, it just makes more economic sense. So that's the direction that we're looking to head. Okay. <clears throat> the budget drives our vision, and two, three years ago, we put together our vision and mission statement in our strategic plan. The strategic plan guides the Weathersfield Public School System. We have three goals that we work on. Number one is student achievement. Number two is civic and family engagement. And number three is our management and operations and finance. So what do we want in this vision? Well, we have vision of our students who are curious, emotionally intelligent and independent. And we have our Board of Ed and our community partners are engaged, mentoring, and resourceful. Our educators are innovative, tenacious, and catalyst. And our family partners are connected, collaborative, and constructive. And this all ties into our core values of being inclusive, committed to lifelong learning and use of knowledge and skills beyond the walls of the high school and the schools and personalized learning. And just to give you an idea of the timeline, we're here before you this evening. Uh, we have a townwide budget hearing coming up on April 15th. I do understand that there's a tentative date uh, for board and council to meet in late April. 
Um, we'll need to confirm that one to make sure. And then, uh, obviously, by the 15th of May, um, our budget allocation needs to be acted upon. So with that, that's our presentation this evening. If you have any questions, we'd certainly be happy to uh, entertain those. Thank you. I appreciate the budget overview. Are there any council members who have questions? Deputy Mayor? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mike, just to begin with, uh, sorry I couldn't make your last budget workshop. It was a makeup, and I had plans that night. Uh, but when we had talked about adding in the um, money for the paying for part of the teachers' pensions, we also talked about you know, where we stood. You know, mm -hmm. Were we above, below, or the medium salary range with our teachers versus the whole state? And you were going to check on that? We are 12.8% 12, 12 above the average. So that two that two hundred and forty nine thousand six hundred six dollars would be figured cost. at would be figured at thirty seven point eight percent, not at twenty five percent. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, going back to page two and three of your presentation, we'll start with three. The um, the funding that came over, or the funding that came over to the town in uh, shared services. Yes. Uh, is that number the projected number for this coming year's budget? That is projected, Tony. Okay. Yes. Yes, it okay. is. Okay. So that, in, in other words, you know, the true budget based on a comparison of last year to this year is three point nine eight percent. Correct. But if you go back to your prior uh, one on page two, uh, I can see that you know the differences in how you come up with the two point six nine. Uh, just for comparison's sake, uh, could someone tell us what the uh, actual budget that's being moved over, or that was in the 1819 budget for what went into shared services? So we can, you know, knock that number out, so we can see the comparison between that and the 57,000, to see what the actual um, increase or decrease is in your budget, because I'm sure some of the increases in the 3.98% are based on utilities and a lot of stuff that have gone away. So if you could get that, I'd appreciate it. Certainly. That. Absolutely. Thank you. Sure. Councillor Forrest. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you, sir. Um, just looking for just like some quick conversations. We've got a whole bunch of things here, but I think they're sort of short hits. There, over the years, there's been a conversation about sort of like this minimum, minimal educational spending that you have to do, and this is obviously something we all know why it's moving down because of the transfer of the funds over to us, but it is moving from the educational budget. Yes. So is there any anticipated issue with the minimal, I forgot what the acronym MBR. is, MCL, MBR, 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 exactly. MBR, yeah. There, there is not. Great question, and that was one that we uh, investigated. Um, as we prepare to present the budget to the board. Given the fact that this is a shared service agreement and it has been approved by both council and the Board of Education, the state feels that this is an appropriate means of reducing the Board of Ed budget. Um, we do have that in writing from the state, and then what will happen is after the budget is, is passed, the state will make that adjustment. But we do not see an issue of violating MBR here, Matthew. Okay. Uh, the next is when we're looking at a lot of the contract drivers, it just came to my mind because a lot of times when we do the budgets, we also do sort of similar goal sharing. And I'm not really sure necessarily how to solve this one yet, but that we do have, we've had this tension, I think, for a while where there's different levels at different union contracts between the town, and let's say you have like an administrative assistant here, and there's also administrative assistant on the board side, and that those contracts are not really sort of lined up in a similar way. So I'll, it's a huge driver, obviously, in your particular budget. It certainly is a large driver in our budget, too. Mm -hmm. um, it would be good to have an ongoing conversation as we sort of go through this process if there's a way to maybe even streamline the negotiation when you have similar people, similar tasks. Obviously, we don't have a huge teacher's contract on the town side. We certainly do have administrative assistance on the town right. side. Administrative <laughs> and there's a lot of similarities in that, in that scope. So as we go through, as these are big drivers, it might be a good idea to have a conversation about how we might be able to line up the town and the Board of Education so we have similar contract for similar work and maybe maybe even find some savings in being able to sort of negotiate those as a whole. 
I'm not necessarily sure that we can do that, but I think those conversations will be fruitful. That's uh, uh, certainly a valid point. You know, just to speak to the contract negotiation with custodians, um, the custodians from the board side were due for negotiations. Uh, we worked with the town. Our HR director, Trent uh, Donahue, worked with Stephanie Askland um, with the town. Is that uh, contract was negotiated. I will tell you there are definitely differences between the town custodial contract and the board custodial contract. This time around as we were just delving into this and just making this transition, I don't think that there was a real effort to make a lot of change at this point in time, but moving forward, it's a very valid uh, argument. Um, I was wondering if we get a copy of this presentation because we don't have a copy here. Yeah, absolutely. That would be great. Uh, I was seeing uh, some of the next level was a bunch of, you know, FTEs mm -hmm. at a school here or school there. And I remember we were having a little bit of issue with class size at the high school, so I noticed there were quite a few on the high school level. And I guess I was curious when we, if we didn't add in those particular staff teachers, what is that pressure being put on to certainly uh, elementary school class sizes, which was always a big driver just two years ago when I was there, and mm -hmm. I'm guessing it still is. Uh, and then also similarly, the serious concerns that still may, maybe still exist at the high school as far as having classes of you know 30, 35, whatever the numbers are. So when we if you you pulled them out, what is the is there a reaction there? For every reaction, there's an equal and opposite reaction. There? Well, certainly one of the things that the board has been adamant about is maintaining low class sizes at the elementary level. This year, um, we actually opened a third section at Hanmer for kindergarten. Right. Um, across the elementary level, I don't believe we got above 25 students in any of our schools. I think 25 was the max, and I want to say that was grades four and five off the top of my head. Um, so we've monitored that. Certainly at the high school level, the number of students in a class is really indicative of the type of class it is. Um, and what we try and do is we try and balance the classes out. In some cases at the high school level, we have a lot of students that want a specific section because it better um, coincides with their, um, their schedule. Um, and we've also got classes that have very few kids in them. Um, and it's you know, some of the higher level language classes, you know, French 4, uh, Italian 5, you're just not getting the numbers there. We still will obviously run those classes. And one of the other challenges here we've seen over the past year is with CTE. I mean, we have a huge number of students that are interested in taking career tech ed courses. So we have our television studio, we have graphic arts, we have robotics, and we have the manufacturing section, which we utilize, but not to its true capacity. So one of the things we've looked at doing this year is partnering with Goodwin College to see if we can partner with them to have a staff member from Goodwin College come over and utilize our manufacturing space. So having those conversations we've had Goodwin come out and take a look at our space and they're quite interested in the space that we have with our auto shop and our manufacturing so can I provide students with an opportunity potentially of you get high school credit and you earn college credit at the same time so we have a student programs and services committee meeting coming up tomorrow we'll broach the subject there so that's something that's in the works I suppose I was looking for a little bit of I saw there was one FTE, I think, on Hanmer, right? Mm -hmm. It was on the list. If we don't have that one FTE, if it's not in your particular budget, what are our rep – somebody asked for it for a reason. Are the class – are we anticipating a huge kindergarten class? At, and I'm not saying that that's what it is. But if we understand what the opportunity cost is, if we're, you have one, we've asked for it. If we don't supply the funds for that, we Correct. get Y. And Correct. one is X and one is Y. You don't have to answer that right now. There were three or four or five that I really caught my. But if you could sort of provide a sure why you asked for it, why it, you know why it was cut or I mean, cut's not the right word. I, I can sorry, speak to reason. that, Matthew. I, that's that's a good question. And that piece with Hanmer, that was an ELL teacher, so that wasn't a classroom teacher. So that would be someone that would actually replace EL tutors and provide direct service to our English language learners at uh, at Hanmer. So that was that piece. Most of our our requests for staffing are really kind of content specific. Okay. Um, the health insurance, I know that John Morris who was there was looking at, uh, not the health, not the health insurance, yeah. but the health insurance, private health insurance covering non-educational costs, mm -hmm. especially for uh, students who uh, 
have a, have a large cost on the budget. Uh, I, I didn't know if there was any movement forward with that that we could start to have conversations about realizing third party revenue coming in to cover non-educational costs but yet are still part of the educational process. Yeah, what we do with regard to a state mandate, we do bill for Medicaid reimbursement. So we have a, a system in place. Uh, it's a third party provider that uh, tracks this when our um, special services providers and our related service providers provide that service. We get reimbursement from Medicaid. Is that new? Uh, it was new as of last year. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And is that, was that the same conversation that John Morris was having or was there even more? No, that? there was more to that with regard to utilizing uh, parents' health insurance. You know, we checked in with our council and found that that was not a viable um, option at this point in time. But is with the Medicaid reimbursement piece, that was a state mandate that we have participated in. Is it possible to see the revenue increases from that particular program or what we've, what we've now derived that we weren't deriving before? I, I can get that. Um, Matt, are you taking all this down? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we can give you a two-day. I would say at this point in time that it's probably not a full year in, but yep. we can certainly get you what we've gotten. And I will caution you, it's likely not an earth-shattering number, but we'll get that. Understood. Now, we noticed that there was a, an increase in the vendor line related to transportation, especially for athletics, mm -hmm. because of all the issues you're talking about with the bus and so on and so forth. Is there a corresponding reduction because now we don't have to spend for those repairs, maintenance of the bus, sale of the bus, yet, you know, the rest mm -hmm. of it. If there is, if you could point that out where it is, how much it is, that would be helpful. Certainly. Um, and as far as the, this is a conversation that we have with almost everything involving something that's of physical, tangible nature. The useful life of the Chromebooks, obviously the tech line is becoming larger and larger. Mm -hmm. And the question is, Although you could be on a replacement policy for the Chromebooks and it comes up on year five and we have the funding because we anticipate that in year five the Chromebooks will be, or whatever the tech is, um, time for replacement. But the Chromebook itself may or may not actually need replacement. So what is the, although you budget for it and it appears that we've had some excellent budgeting in this mm -hmm. line, what is actually the policy of, re do, we, do we replace the Chromebooks when they reach year, fill in the blank, and it doesn't have to be Chromebooks, it could be Macs, it could be anything, right? Well, I'll use Chromebooks as an example. We say it's the useful life, but if half, maybe half of them have become so deteriorated that they can't be used, but still there's half that are functional. Mm -hmm. So what is, our, what is the policy about actually replacing them versus anticipating replacing them well one of the things i would tell you is we would look to repurpose them wherever we could and one of the things we have to be careful of here is that our chromebooks are utilized for our high stakes testing so i have to make sure that i have units that have the latest operating system to tie in with the state testing with those units that that come offline that are no longer able to support that those might be units that i get down to the kindergarten level where I can get some of the basic curricular materials onto those and I can get those into the hands of kindergarten. So the idea here would not be to just arbitrarily pull them all out and that's it and send them on their way. It would be to reallocate them and rotate them through. These are used all the time and I'm having an issue um, with a group of Dell units that are not performing as they should be up at the high school. So I'm pulling those back and I had to reallocate from grade two to move the grade two Chromebooks up to the high school kids because they use them more frequently. I got my first letter of protest from a second grader today. <laughs> and she <laughs> argues a very good piece of opinion writing in grade two. <laughs> and she talks about everything she uses the Chromebook for. So what will happen, obviously I'll be going to meet with her later this week, um, <laughs> but what will happen now is we'll reallocate. We've got grade three units on carts that we can reallocate down and have them swap out with grade two. So the idea here, Matthew, is that you want to develop a, a, a cadre of these units. We have them for um, uh, loaner units. Um, unfortunately, I don't have everybody that's really good about bringing their units in. They'll leave them home on occasion, or they will bring them in not charged. So those units will be loaned out on a daily basis because they are using them in classrooms. So, And I'd be happy to provide you more information and more detail with regard to the lease history as well as the um, proposal for purchase. Uh, the most interesting fact if you, as, you, as you move through is because now we're moving through 
a lot of most KISS students have them or through the operation, the first lease cycle, moving in the purchase cycle, and I'm sure there's many cycles, is understanding what was our anticipated use life and then what percentage actually had that use life mm -hmm. versus a longer use life in order to start anticipating what the budget needs to be for replacement of these. You know, we anticipated mm -hmm. five years, but only half of them actually died, so we can increase or decrease whatever that budget line is. Mm -hmm. That kind of data would be something I'd be interested in. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? Other questions? Councilor Rell? <coughs> Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Bobby. Uh, I appreciate you guys coming tonight. Uh, actually, just to answer one of those questions, it looks that um, Councillor uh, Forrest had on, and now I'm sorry for the public, I'm jumping to the actual 153 page budget, doing, if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, looks like page eight, there's a savings of 900 and, no, $9,760 in diesel fuel. I assume that is the athletic buses. That'll be the mistaken. athletic buses, and that's also the generator at the high school as well. Okay. Um, so that's, it doesn't show the maintenance on the two buses, but I would imagine. No, we'll find that in the specific lines and get that information to you. Okay. Uh, also on that page, there are a couple other uh, and I'm sorry, I was trying to pay attention and I got one slide behind and I was trying to pay, uh, play catch up on the utilities, mm -hmm. natural gas, water, yes. electricity. Mm -hmm. Where do we realize those savings from? We're not realizing the savings there in uh, terms of utilities. That's okay. just a so shift. That's just a shift. A, yep. Yes. That is part of the shared. Okay. That, that's, so that's, cor that's correct. And we, we originally, when we presented this budget, the utilities remained in the uh, Board of Ed budget, and they've shifted over to the town. And, again, that was conversation that we had at one of our budget workshops. Yep. I talked most recently with Sally Katz this morning. Um, she's comfortable with it. And again, you know, I'd love to know other ways we can look to reduce the, the cost. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, we looked at that um, transmission process, who we're getting our electricity from at Weathersfield High School. We're not sure how that happened. And again, okay. we coordinate with the town on that in terms of our electric supplier. So Matt is certainly looking into that. Right. I, yeah, I had heard the variable rate, so I for a second assumed that there was some type of now looking down sure enough it's yeah 100 percent realized savings on both of those uh there is also a savings on repairs and maintenance uh page six on this it looks like it went from 420 422 thousand down to 102 thousand roughly about a 75 percent mm -hmm. where where do we see that savings? Mm -hmm. that's custodial, custodial maintenance. That's another shift. It's okay. custodial maintenance. So it's not the full 100%, but it would be you guys take some of that and keep it in your budget. Yes. Okay. Um, and then I mean, we're going to go in a little bit deeper, you know, in the next couple of weeks. But there's also a. I just noticed a position, and I don't know if this position is a new position or not, but it's an instructional supervisory role, instructional supervisor position. I don't know if it's a back office. That would be an administrative position, not, not a new position. Okay. It's, it's, we have one instructional, so actually we have two. Let me uh, preface that. And let me talk a little bit about shared services on the IT side. I have an instructional supervisor um, for curriculum. That's a position that's over at the Stillman building. And I have an instructional supervisor for technology. That position is a reclassification of the position that Keith Raffanello held mm -hmm. as director of technology. Um, we reallocated that position to a lower level, so it's not a director, it's now an instructional supervisor, so there's a lower rate there. In addition to that, what we did was we took our power school manager, we elevated him to a supervisor role he is non-union, so he supports the town side, which saves you the $10,000 in the stipend. So with the 092 for the instructional supervisor, she stays over on the board side and she supports learning in the classroom, all of those Chromebooks, teachers, and the one-to-one. -one. So that's how we look to realize some savings. So we think we've actually made the IT department even stronger. Okay. And 
there would be one on the town side and two well there would be a IT personnel on the board side plus a supervisor position on the board side we have two, two supervisors we have an instructional supervisor and a software supervisor you also have the network engineer Jim DeReagan Jim is a board employee, but Jim actually does the bulk of his work over on the town side because your work is primarily network based and in including and expanding upon the network. So Jim is all over the police cameras. Jim builds the networks in terms of the connection to all of our uh, camera system, our surveillance system throughout the district being fed up into the police department. Jim's behind that. So Jim does a lot of the software, and then Jeff Telke, our, our supervisor, our technology supervisor, will support both the Board of Education as well as the, as the town. So there will be no lapse of service. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'm sure we'll start to dig into this a little bit more in the next couple of weeks, but uh, I do appreciate you answering those quick questions. Thank My you. My pleasure. Thank you. Other questions? Go ahead, Jody. Thank you for your presentation tonight. I do um, appreciate the fact, and I'm sure as everyone does, that you are trying to do more with less and moving things around very smartly and efficiently. So I, that really goes a long way. Thank you. Um, my question was, I'm just kind of perusing this for the first time, so I apologize, just so that over the next few weeks as we get into our workshops, we know where to look. Um, where in the budget do those escrow accounts sit, and were those cleaned up, and do we have policies and all that in place? Mm -hmm. We do. Can you speak to that, Matt? Sure. We have various student and district-wide activity accounts, but this is just the general fund. Would you speak fund. into the microphone so Sorry. I can hear you on TV? This is the general fund operating budget. Those are trust and agency funds. It's a different classification, so that's not part of this budget. Will we talk about those in workshop or no? We can. Okay. Just because I think that for all of us, we probably just want to make sure that we're up to date on the changes that probably have happened over the mm -hmm. last two mm -hmm. years. Yep. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Matt. Co Councilor Lesser. Thank you, Mayor. I uh, enjoyed your presentation. Thank you, Michael and Bobby. And thanks Thank for you. including a picture of my daughter. Appreciate it. <laughs> I just have one question. It relates to There Paige. were two pictures of her. Two pictures. Well, yeah. I only know this one. Thank she you. She was in the fir first one, too. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just have one question. It's on slide 12, and it has to do with the ABA and STRIVE programs and the, and the yes. savings. I'll wait till you get there. So if I'm understanding this correctly, on the right-hand side, the realized savings of one student, 55827 Is that mean to say that that's the cost for us to educate one student if we send her or him outside of the district for the, for the year? That's correct. 55827 that's correct, and that doesn't take into account transportation. So along those lines, do you have the numbers of how many students we send out and a plan for how many we hope to bring back over the next few years? That's a, an incredibly significant cost, and I know that's part of the savings. And then Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, well, the idea here is to um, utilize the um, PPT process. So I have a director of special services, John Kazar, and I have a supervisor of special services, Liz Freitas. They go out and they are responsible for all of our out-of-district placements. And we always make the decision not on money, but on the best interest of the child. So if we have the program in district that we can provide for that student, a PPT meeting would be held. Typically they happen in the springtime and there's a transition process. So for example, with our student in the STRIVE program, where that focuses on our students with um, behavioral concerns, we transitioned that student back starting last year. So they did part-time at the outplacement and then part-time here in Wethersfield, and then they made the full transition back in September. One of the things that's a challenge when we have these out-of-district placements, I will be very frank with you, in many cases, the level of academic rigor is not anywhere close to what they get here in Wethersfield. And when we have these students come back from these out-of-district placements, there are some tremendous gaps academically that we have to, uh, we have to um, close. So the idea here is developing the programming in-house. And I have to be honest, in some cases, students need more than I can provide in district. And I have to look at those as well. So, Understand. Um, makes sense. So do we have, and don't need them tonight, the numbers of how many are participating and, and, and plan to try and bring more back each year? Yes, I can provide you with a uh, listing of how many we have out 
Um, and there are categories within for those students that we outplace. Some are outplaced through us through a PPT decision. Some of them are placed out through um, a mediation process or a due process component. Some are placed by DCF um, as well. So we look at those and in some cases if it's a DCF placement, I may not have the ability at a PPT meeting to argue their program, our program is most appropriate. Understood. It's just a staggering per student cost for, mm. for one student. It, it, and it is throughout the, the state in terms of the special education costs. I know that I, over in Newington it was the same scenario. They were talking about the astronomical special education costs. And, you know, we do the best we can, like I mentioned earlier, about that ride share or developing, like with our transition academy, Weathersfield Transition Academy. Um, we have students that typically would be going out. We're providing them support here in district. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay. Seeing none. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank and we you. look Thanks. forward Have to seeing year. you back in April. Absolutely. Thank you. Next, we have a series of hearings. We will start with the, the hearing on the certified resolution of the town of Weathersfield Author, uh, authorizing the application for a Connecticut Small Cities Community Development Block Grant. Is there anybody who would like to speak to that hearing specifically? Come on up, George. Good evening, I'm George Kelly. I'm the uh, chair of the uh, uh, Board of Commissioners of the Housing Authority. <clears throat> and I am a poor substitute for our executive director, Kate Forcier, who is uh, unable to be here tonight. Uh, as I think your materials show, uh, the town has applied on behalf of the Housing Authority for a uh, uh, small cities community development block grant uh, this one, the, 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 the one that we uh, hope to obtain with the town's approval is for the Harvey Fuller housing. Uh, it's really to continue work that began uh, as part of the uh, 2018 uh, grant, some of which went to the, uh, the Fuller housing project. Essentially, the, the work is being done to abate asbestos, replace flooring, uh, repair uh, concrete slabs. Uh, a lot of this, uh, well, the building is, it, it, renovation of the building as housing occurred, I think, in 87 or 88. Uh, apparently, we've learned a lot about converting schools to housing since then, and uh, some of this work is, is to uh, redo and improve on some of the initial work, uh, hopefully with the abatement to prevent larger expenses in the future. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the request, uh, I think, is a, very consistent with what the uh, 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 purpose of, of the grant is, or of, of this state program. Uh, it's really to, to promote, develop affordable housing, among other things. And that's what this unit is. In particular, the Harvey Fuller housing consists of uh, 32 units of elderly housing, uh, which as a practical matter means elderly and uh, disabled. Uh, so that's, that's the purpose of this request. Uh, I'd certainly try to respond to any questions and the other, uh, I know the other thing you need to cover tonight is the uh, status of the 2018 project. As I said, uh, well, actually, the bids, I think, are going to be open this week on that project. Uh, sure, and I think um, we'll probably call you back up okay. when right. we get into the council discussion if we do have questions since you okay. are representing the Housing Authority okay. this evening. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Is there anybody else who would like to speak on this hearing only? Come on up, Mr. Young.
Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Um, I, I didn't catch how much money this grant was. Does anybody know? Yes, it's in the packet. It's 1500000 That's a tremendous amount of money, madam. You know, I, I've, been, I've been coming to these meetings for years, and the, this housing authority keeps coming up here n wanting more grants. And, you know, it's not like the money is, grows on trees and they go out and pick it. You know, people have to work for this money. Uh, politicians have to go out and borrow to get this kind of money. And, you know, we, we just can't keep going on forever and ever. And with all the money that's been spent on these buildings, you'd think they'd be immaculate. You'd think that they'd be beautiful homes. Because over the years, we've spent millions of borrowed and taxpayers' money. I would recommend you say no to this grant. We don't need to continue our debt. And we have to think about our local debt, our state debt, and our federal debt, which all of them continue to grow. And they grow and they grow thanks to our politicians who don't care but do things for votes. I recommend you vote this down. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak for the hearing? Um, are you, you're the gentleman from the um, grant. Are you going to? Yes, I would just like to introduce myself and say a little bit about um, the public hearing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, that, that's fine. Um, we will have you up during, probably during the um, council action portion as well so that we can ask you questions. This portion you can only speak um, you know, it's a it's a one way dialogue. If yeah. okay, sure, come on up, sir. Thank you. And if you would just state your name and your position, you have five minutes to speak. My name is Peter Huckins. I am uh, from Community Consulting. I've been hired by the town to uh, write and submit this grant, as well as uh, the 2018. Uh, I wrote that, it was awarded, and we're implementing that right now. I just wanted to, first of all, introduce myself to everyone. Sometimes I only see you once a year, so uh, I am doing that. Also, I'd like to uh, discuss a little bit about the importance of uh, the public hearing. This gentleman, uh, he stated that he thought we should say no to this. Uh, this is a forum for uh, public community uh, to state, um, to find out about the project, find out about the project and also to ask questions and also to say either they support it or they don't. The grant is funded from the uh, department, it's funded from HUD and it's administered through the Department of Housing on the state level. Uh, eligible towns are of population of 50,000 or less. And there's four categories, housing, economic development, community facilities, and public service. This is obviously a housing grant. They must meet the national objective of uh, benefit to low to moderate income. The grant funds must at least uh, give benefit to 51% of the grant must benefit low to moderate income. This will uh, do 100%. And also, they're required to have two public hearings. The first one before the application is submitted. And there's a second one, once it has been completed within 30 days of completion, we are obligated to have a second public hearing to go over exactly how the project turned out, the ups and downs, or, and also answer any questions from the public. So I would just like to state that um, while uh, these public hearing minutes, they are submitted with the grant application. So the uh, staff at Department of Housing does read these minutes. And you can just, as the gentleman stated, he voting against it. Uh, anyone here can raise their hand and say they are for it. That goes in the minutes, and that'll show the Department of Housing that the community is behind this uh, grant proposal. So um, I will answer any questions after this in the, the other part of the public hearing. But right now, I just want to let you know about uh, the reason why there is a community outreach, a community component of this grant application. It's very important to the funding source 
uh, that we conduct this and they do look at it. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak out? Come on up. Excuse me. Um, Janice de Roberts, 87 Meadowgate Street. Um, last year, I attended many housing authority meetings, and just based on listening to them and the way they weigh things and debate things and the hard work that they do and the careful, um, how careful they are about the decisions they make, I would say that if they're saying they need this, my inclination after a full year of going to their meetings is that I would support them. That's Thank it. you. Appreciate that. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Mr. Uh, Colantonio, come on up. Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. Good evening. Uh, Good evening. I have to state that I'm against it. And only because I guess I don't really like what, uh, what the town is doing. Here we are, like, you know, year after year, we spend money for housing authority and this and that. It's a lot of money. Where it comes from, it doesn't really matter. It's a lot of money that we spend it. My neighbor in the back has been there for a few years. He received a house from his uncle and aunts. Never had any kids. They've been paying taxes. They were there before me for so many years, they never got anything in return. And yet, whatever you guys have done it, you auctioned that house. It was sold for pennies. And now you're talking about giving money some other place. What is the difference if somebody falls into hardship, they cannot pay the tax in two or three years and you kick him out? What's gonna happen to this young guy? Only 45, 50 years old. And you're always talking about, like, you know, give this here, give this there. No consequence at all. There is not fairness at all. But anyway, that's why I'm against it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colantonio. Anyone else to speak this evening? Okay, so we'll declare that here. Oh. You know, the council members can also... This is, this is a public hearing. The public speaks at this point. We will speak to it when we have council action later in the meeting. Um, the next hearing is a resolution of the Town of Weathersfield establishing a program income reuse plan from CDBG assisted activities. Does anybody wish to speak on this um, hearing? Okay, seeing no one, I declare the hearing closed. Next is a resolution for the use of program income. Is there anybody who would like to speak on this resolution? Is there anybody who'd like to speak on this resolution? Mr. Young. Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Besides what you just said, Mayor, about program income, what can you share with us? I, I, didn't, I didn't read the information in the, in the minutes or the agenda. What are you planning on doing with program income? It's in, it, there is a um, item in the agenda. What? This is your time to speak, sir. Well, I don't want you to give the program income away like you give everything else away, if that's what you're saying. And, and it's pretty poor that you can't explain more of what you're going to do with program income. I mean, I know what program income is, but what are you going to do with it? How can you ask people with what little you just said to come up here and make a, make a statement? It's almost as bad as telling us that we have to go vote on a Keisha farm for $2.4 million without giving us the appraisal. It's equivalent to that. Thank you very much. I would keep the program income in the bank account. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak on this hearing? Okay, seeing none, moving into the last hearing, 2018 Small Cities Grant Discussion. Is there anybody that would like to speak to the 2018 Small Cities Grant Discussion? Anybody who'd like to speak? 
Okay, I see. We have to discuss it. I thought this gentleman. No, you shouldn't even be talking at this point. Quiet. You're out of order. Uh, Mr. Young, so are you. Um, Mr. Kelly, Mr. Kelly, are you speaking to this tonight? I can't speak to that uh, now or, or later. Uh, I also speak. Uh, if you would just identify yes, yourself George, again and then speak George to this Kelly, during uh, the public hearing. I'm the chair of the uh, Board of Commissioners of the Housing Authority. Uh, the 2018 grant, uh, that's the one on which uh, it has been approved uh, uh, bids on the projects it supports uh, will be opened this week and it uh, involves work again at the Harvey Fuller housing uh, elderly housing as well as work at the Highview Terrace uh, moderate income housing uh, and again, it's part of an ongoing uh, project uh, by the Housing Authority to upgrade and improve both properties. Uh, the work that's planned uh, includes uh, their, their work on the bathrooms, uh, just, just various items throughout the whole, uh, each of the, uh, of the two projects. Uh, Again, the, the work has been, uh, or the grant has been uh, approved, and what we will be doing with the money is to uh, replace flooring at Highview, uh, replace cabinets, bathroom toilets, uh, a number of other things. And at Fuller, uh, uh, it's work on flooring again, uh, mechanical baseboard, thermostats, uh, exterior doors, just a, a lot of the maintenance and upgrade that's necessary in a project uh, of this size and, and this type. Uh, and again, the hope is that this work will enable us to avoid any larger expenses down the road. Uh, uh, with respect to Fuller, it's really the beginning of the project that uh, is the subject of the 2019 application so I would uh, uh, well that's that's the report on the 2018 funding thank you I appreciate that is there anybody else who'd like to speak on that is there anybody else who'd like to speak seeing none we declare that hearing closed we are now moving into general comments. First order of business, public comment. Members of the public have five minutes to speak on any topic. Is there anybody from the public who'd like to speak this evening? Mr. Young. Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Um, I did uh, listen to the Board of Education's presentation on the budget at their last meeting. I think it was last week. And, uh, of course, this week, listening to it, and, you know, the thing that bothers me is, for years I've asked where you have slides, and it says a dollar amount, a nomenclature, which is a line item, followed by, oh, it's going to increase by $36,000. I've asked time and time again, put in the dollar amount that you're currently spending and then show the $36,000. I think it gives someone an idea of what, what the, the global effect is here on that line item. But of course, our board doesn't do that. And we should be doing that too on the town side in your presentations. So we can see what you're currently spending, how much it's going up or down, and maybe even a percentage to show. I mean, it gives the audience, the citizens, some kind of a feel that we can, we can figure out what's happening. But I'd like to also talk and continue talking about the Keisha farm, the farm that you went on contract for for $75,000 an acre or $2.4 million for 32 acres. 
And, and I believe a couple meetings ago, I spoke about a property at 1088 New Britain Avenue. I think I sent that out this evening before I came. Uh, evidently, that was uh, 26, 27 acres of land with a nice house for the price tag of $899,000. That came out to somewhere around $33,000 an acre. Four miles from your Keisha farm that you're, you, you went on contract for $75,000 an acre. I mean, and, and I wanted to say that this particular property is now on contract. So it's moving along. And I think it's good, but I want to also say, in the year 2018, we're in 19 now, we've only had a few sales out there. And the averages were running around $25,000, $24,000 an acre. Between Windsor, between Glastonbury, and Glastonbury. And you're paying $75,000 an acre. Far cry from what market value is. Also, along the way, oh, since the last meeting, I would say there's probably about 10 or 12 more properties that came on the market. All in, the, all in our area, up and down the, the valley. Um, Cromwell had one. Uh, where was it here? Here's Cromwell. Cromwell had a 10-acre parcel that came on the market for $319,000. That's $31,000 an acre. Far cry from your 75000 that you went on contract for. There's other towns here like Cheshire that has, and Cheshire's a town just like ours in the EDG group, uh, the education, uh, the, the demographics, and all of that kind of crazy stuff. And, you know, looking at Cheshire, and, and I've recited some of these in the past, but here's, here's a 50-acre parcel for $19,000 an acre that's for sale. An eight-acre parcel for 67,000, closer to your number, but it's a very small amount of acreage, eight. 11 acres for 31,000. 29 acres for 16,000. You know, these kinds of prices don't equal to what, you're, what you went on contract for. You're the smartest and brightest that we have in our town. And my gosh, I don't know how in the world you did such a thing. We have other towns, Farmington. There was a 34-acre parcel that came on the market for 1.7 million. That's 50,000 bucks an acre. That's Tony Town, Farmington. That is a town that has low taxes. That is a town that has been, been booming as far as dollars go and quality of life goes. Not like us, who are next to Harford, a real drag. But we pay $75,000. You go on contract for $75,000 for a piece of property, which okay, is outrageous. Thank you, Mr. Young. We'll Would you wrap more. it up, please? Yes, madam. I just want to let you know that it, it, it's pretty disturbing. It's pretty disturbing to go and, and look around and see what properties are selling for and how outrageous the prices that you folks negotiated for. And I'm really, you know, and being that you held back on that appraisal, you didn't even share it with the public. And everybody's got to know about it in town, madam, because I send out stuff all over. Okay, and thank I let you. them know, yes, madam, you're, you're sir, running a fine ship here. And thank you, going sir. Down. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Mr. Colantonio, come on up. Good evening again, Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. Uh, I must say that my wife, a couple of years, I guess a couple of weeks ago when we had the snowstorm, she called physical services and she complained and the following day they came out and they fixed it. Thank you. It was, Glad to uh, hear that. It was kind of nice, you know. Uh, the Board of Education presentation, contractual agreement, contractual agreement. I hate that. Why? Many reasons. But it just crossed my mind. I've been out of work for 11 years, or retired for 11 years, 
and every year the budget on a percentage base went higher, what was much higher than what I make on a yearly basis. So in reality, let's say that I live to be 100, which is a few more years on the road. And if things keep on going like that, I could not afford to live in Wethersfield anymore. If I could not pay the taxes after three years, you're going to kick me out. That's sad. And I'm, I'm sure that I'm not the only one older gentleman, I guess, or older guy, you know, in Wethersfield that is in my stage where, where like, you know, we're waiting on Social Security. Like this, you know, a few years on the road says, hey, I'm sorry, you cannot pay the taxes. Even though you lived right here for 50, 60 years and you pay tax every year, you got to get out. We're going to sell your house. That's not right. Uh, another occasion now, another... Last year, sometimes, I, I asked a question, and I never got an answer. Not that I expect an answer tonight, but, you know. What's uh, the procedure of, set, of setting speed limits on any streets in town? Is it 25? Is it 30? Is it 35? What are the, I guess, the reason to, to set it at 30 or 35 or 40? I mean, there must be guidelines. I never got an answer. Now. Why am I saying that? Every once in a while, and I watch a lot of TV, you know, especially in the winter time, I watch a lot of news. And every once in a while you see some pedestrians get hit, they get killed. In Norwich, here and there, you know, all over Connecticut. I mean, and I don't know, you know, the rest of the nation, how many times it happens. But the things that come to mind is like, you know, Collier Road. We just bought the property, I guess, you know, on Collier Road. That's a 30-foot wide road. The posted speed is 35, and no sidewalks. Now, spring is coming around. People feel like walking. Posted speed, 35. A lot of people don't go 35. They usually break the law, and they go 40, 45, 50. And anybody that walks on that road has to share the traffic, or has to share the space with the traffic. I think it's dangerous. I said it before, and I'm going to say it again. What are the guidelines that sets speed limits at any roads in Connecticut? Because let's face it, not too long ago, again, Silas Dean was 35 miles per hour posted speed, and Walker Hill was 40. Why? Okay. Wells Road is 40, just right be beside the school, just before you get to school. And I ask, why? How many times do I have to bring it up? I mean, what kind of service we get in Wethersfield, the people that pay taxes on a, on a yearly basis? You see, like, you know, potholes. When you go from Wethersfield to Rocky Hill, it's atrocious. There are potholes all the time. As soon as you go to Rocky Hill, it seems that the roadways are much better. You have to ask yourself, why? At least I do as an engineer. I mean, it seems to me that between Wethersfield and Rocky, we are next to each other. And you can tell the difference so much. Why? Is it because we try to fix it and then we don't really know the inspector and the contractor cheats? I mean, why is that? It seems to me that we pay more taxes in Wethersfield than in Rocky Hill. Why don't we get the service that we deserve, I guess? But anyway, I still have 50 cents. Mr. Young, you can use my time sometime. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Colantonio. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Come on up, sir. Hey, uh, Paul Milney, 52 Livingston Street, Weathersfield. Um, I'm going to start out on a, a good thing. That always helps. Um, it was always kind of zooey down at the high school, dropping kids off. You see U-turns, all kinds of crazy things, people here and there. I like the two crossing guards. I mean, there was a lot of comment about that earlier in the year, but that, that does help things a lot. Now, the other thing, you've got, <coughs> you got a lot of big stuff on your plate, but i got uh, small stuff. Hopefully, it's a small fix. So I'm over on Jordan Lane today, and I come up. I'm walking, and I come up to the stop sign. The stop signs over there are this high. Beautiful brand new stop sign. Under it, beautiful red square, all ways. Under that, an 11 by 14, waterproof, white sign, we buy houses, as is, pay cash. Fastened to the sign with two 
heavy duty zip ties. And not only is it on one stop sign, it's on four of them at the intersection. Which, which intersection? This is Jordan Walcott Lane. Hill and, and Jordan Lane. Jordan Lane and Walcott, Walcott Hill and Jordan Lane. Okay. Now, I can rip them down, but I think they'll just come back. And they're taking advantage of people who are desperate. I'm sure a realtor in town would help you if you needed to sell your house and liquidate it. Um, it's not legal, as far as I know. I mean, I couldn't find anything about legality other than you can't post a sign for your business except on your own property. Um, but if we send them a message, if it becomes like a tax collector thing where they get it in the mail, and if you don't do it, then you send out a marshal. There's a, there is a process. We do have a process in town, so we'll have someone. Wouldn't be that. a lot of work. Yeah. It's bad enough they're popping up along the side of the road. Well, well, that was easy. I appreciate that. All right. Um, now, not to ruffle any feathers here, but like we, like someone said, we all have our own opinions. I just want to say that I thought the Kissia Farm was a good purchase. It's all about location, location, location. Sorry for having to say that, Robert. Um, they got what they asked for, or there was some kind of bargaining. I'm sure we didn't just give it; they were just giving it away. And there's a lot of multi-use features that I paid attention to. There's educational opportunities. There's field opportunities. It's it's developed farmland, and it went through referendum. And there was uh, a lot of other people I think that wanted to see it there too. So I just uh, I just wanted to mention that. And if you want, I'll rip down the signs tomorrow. But <laughs> we'll have someone take care of that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I left, I left three two minutes. <laughs> Thank you. We appreciate it. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Anybody else? Okay. Seeing none, we will close public hearing. We'll move into council reports. Any council members have reports this evening? Councilor Latina. I just want to speak on behalf of the folks at the Persons with Disabilities Committee that um, they've been having lots of conversations about the new train service um, and obviously just want to be on the record that they're very concerned over safety at crossings, especially within their community and any kind of outreach um, they really want to be a part of. And they also, um, I've been forwarding them some of the correspondence that we've been getting, but just so that we're keeping all our different groups in the loop because it's going to be a big change. Thank you, and I do agree. It's, Information and education is very important with the beginning of the train service. Anybody else? Councilor Lesser. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> On Wednesday the 13th, last Wednesday, we had the Veterans Committee meeting. And just to update you, we are going to have a retreat on Saturday, March 30th to do some uh, planning, strategic planning for the Veterans Committee for activities. And the second thing, which I have reported on before, uh, is on June 6th, 2019, we will be celebrating the 75th anniversary of D-Day. It's a partnership between the Veterans Committee and Weathersfield High School. It's open to the public. It will be on the football field. And we are looking for about um, 20 to 30 veterans, uh, local veterans to participate. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, who's going to be involved. And we do have some, but we're looking for more to participate that day. So that's the Veterans Committee. Secondly and lastly, I attended the Chamber uh, a Commerce meeting, uh, now it's about a week and a half ago, um, and a couple updates from there. The most important one was our new town manager was introduced and was everyone was happy to see him there, which was great. Um, we also talked about, this is also important, uh, we had a report from, I think it was Officer Minter, I'm not sure if his last name is Mitney. 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 Okay. Mitney. And uh, had reported on many things, but one of particular note that I'll mention here is he mentioned uh, that Weathersfield has the lowest crime rate of all of the six contiguous towns that uh, are, I guess, next to Hartford. Uh, and that was nice information to hear. And those statistics are available, but we were the lowest in terms of the crime rate. So a lot of upcoming chamber events in the spring, and I'll be able to report on them next time. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councilor Rell, did you have something? Um, kind of just to piggyback off of what Councilman Lesser had said, uh, the Memorial Day Parade, and I don't know if um, Councilman Spinell or um, Bratton wanted to speak on that, but uh, we are part of the Memorial Day Parade Committee, and uh, it may be winter out there now, but we are planning for a spring mm -hmm. good weather parade uh, Saturday, May 25th. People do have time to plan for it. And I am sure there's going to be some press releases going out inviting um, you know, area residents who uh, um, are veterans to come and uh, take part in it, um, as well as youthful activities to um, you know, 
recognize and memorialize those who have um, served and made the ultimate sacrifice. Um, it's a tradition uh, like no other in Old Weathersfield, and we're proud of it, and we are proud to uh, represent so many outstanding folks. So, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Go ahead, Councilor Forrest. Sure. Uh, the redevelopment agency met. They elected Mark Tran as the chair. Uh, Tom Penzola was the vice chair. A lot of good conversation, originating meeting from being dormant for quite a few years, and they're ready to go and roll up their sleeves. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, so seeing no more council reports, councilor comments. Do any council members have comments on anything? Councilor Rell. I know Jody had mentioned it, but uh, I was at that uh, meeting, public meeting at Webb School on the train, and uh, I did speak with some members of our delegation. Uh, if it, you know, pleases the, the council, I would like to uh, request at least a, a meeting or uh, more information from the company that is looking to uh, uh, reuse or uh, um, start up the train service again. If they could present something to us, uh, you know, we do. We've heard the questions and concerns from residents on safety, uh, timing, noise decibels. Um, if we could get some answers from them um, on what their plan is, when it plans to start, um, that hopefully can get, you know to the public and uh, um, help to uh, allay some of the fears that they have with the new train service coming through town. Thank you. Um, we do have some educational materials that were handed out. The town manager is going to be getting more of these to hand out. Um, we can hand them out at local businesses if they'll allow it. Um, they'll be available in the library, schools, and the town clerk's office. Um, and I agree, we, we heard a lot of um, concerns at that meeting and um, there weren't as many answers as I think any of us would have liked. Um, Gary and Derek, the town engineer, are both working with DOT um, to get some more information. Start dates, um, you know, the, the railroad does not know times yet and apparently their whistles do not have to follow our noise ordinance. So there's definitely things that we need to follow up on and, and just to make all, to alleviate some of our concerns and fears at this point. Um, these flyers, you'll be getting these shortly though. Yep. And follow up with us once you've had another conversation with DOPT. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, any other council comments? Deputy Mayor? Yeah, I was at that same meeting. I stayed until the very end and uh, I talked to the state staff afterwards. And, uh, you know, one of the biggest concerns I heard from the people were uh, the concerns about the kids' safety and them being educated from the tracks being so dormant. And they do have a, a program and work where they're going to get together with the board ed on that. And they said most board ed, eds are good at getting together with them and some aren't. And uh, I, I did give the gentleman in charge my, my card and said, if the board of ed does drag their feet to let me know, and I'll be glad and get in touch with the chairman and we'll get them there. It sounds like you know they're going to start two or three weeks before things start to start educating the kids, teaching them what's what. You know, I did hear the people's comments like, you know, we want crossing guards there when the kids cross. Well, first we got to find out when the trains are going to go through. I mean, I heard all the comments. Some people are saying it's the middle of the night, but from a you know a thinking standpoint, from business, if they're going to unload a train with building materials down in Middletown. They're going to do it during the day and not late at night when there's nobody there. Or bring someone in an overtime, but I think there was a lot of speculation. But there's, they're going to be getting us some answers on all that stuff. Okay. Anything else from council? Uh, just a couple events that are coming up. The Weathersfield Alumni Athletic Hall of Fame is having their event on March 30th. Tickets are available. The 14th annual Taste of Weathersfield is August, uh, August, April 6th. Uh, tickets for that are uh, available um, online as well. Um, next, we have the town manager's report. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you to the council. Um, I guess I'll continue that conversation about the train in a moment. So we're going to look to capitalize on the educational and create an educational outreach plan, uh, which includes the school system for letting individuals know what's going on with the train. At this point, I'd like to just continue to reiterate and create a reminder so we're talking about it um, as often as possible. 
just a reminder re to residents that the train service will begin sometime in the next few weeks. They're targeting April, but they're not giving us an exact date at this point. Um, the, the, to start, at least, again, they're not necessarily committing that it won't increase, but they're estimating approximately two trips per day through town, one going out, another one coming in, uh, which would be approximately 25 cars heading around 10 miles per hour, or not to exceed 10 miles per hour. Uh, there will be stop signs and or yield signs installed at all crossings, which is something different. It's not currently in place. Uh, with the exception of the crossing at Route 3 and Wells Road, there will be no active warning signs other than the train's horn, which will blast about 15 to 20 seconds before it enters any crossing. So we remind residents to be cautious of these new changes and more importantly to remind children of the hazards related to the tracks. And we're going to continue to re reiterate this information over and over again. Um, for more information, please contact the town engineering division who is working on it or my office in the uh, town manager's office. I am working on getting as many brochures as possible so that we can start to blanket them throughout uh, the town, uh, businesses, school systems, uh, municipal buildings. Uh, and just uh, lastly to follow up, April 15th is a budget presentation and hearing. And again, this is going out for the re as a reminder to the residents. Um, as a follow-up, um, as a follow-up to that, has the Department of Transportation done any kind of a study on what putting a stop sign or a yield sign at the tracks will do for the flow of traffic on the Silestine Highway? So, if you're putting a stop sign at the train tracks on Jordan Lane or Knott Street or Church Street, and then you um, have a train that's going through for a minute and a half. How does that impact cars? Could cars, in theory, be in the middle of the Silestine Highway? Um, and those lights will not, uh, there won't be an activation for those lights to turn everything red when the train is passing. So has there been any study on the flow of traffic? Uh, I don't think there's been anything officially produced at this point. Uh, that has been a conversation that we've expressed several times. Uh, our town engineer is working with the DOT to get clarification, but at this point there is no active signalization in place that would necessarily trigger the light switch to change when the train is at a certain distance or a certain area at a certain crossing. Um, all those conversations have been on the table. I have been keeping a list, so I'm, I'm more than happy to increase that list and invite individuals to have that discussion with the DOT. It's certainly something that we should think about. Pursue, yep. Yeah, okay. Um, anything else? Nope. That's it at this point. Well, Mike. <laughs> back to the noise concern, and I, I think that's what I'm hearing most about is the concern. So, you know, put aside the timing-wise, if it's two trains and they're, you know, from 8 p.m. to 4 a.m., that's a concern. The other concern is, if I heard correctly, they're going to be blowing their whistle for 20 seconds. At the, each intersection? If I heard yeah, 15, the, the federal regulation is they have to blow it within 15 to 20 seconds of 15 each. 15 to 20 seconds. Yep. 25 cars, and I, if memory serves me correctly, there's six crossings? Ten. There's actually well, 10 crossings. Well, I think what they when they do 10, I, if I counted it out correctly, it's eastbound, westbound. No, there's, there are 10 crossings, eight, eight public streets, and two private driveways oh, really? that cross okay. the tracks. Yeah. So if and the Boy go... Scouts made me name all of them at a meeting I went to last <laughs> week. Because it passed, just to see if, if you could. If there are, so if there are 10, at 20, 15 to 20 seconds each, and a 25 minimum car, I mean, that's almost a consistent whistle from the crossing. They blow it as they approach. Yes. So for 15 I, seconds as they approach, so right. and then the train goes by. By all, by no means, my you know, a math expert. So it goes by the next intersection. Yes. Yeah. So it's about it's going to take the train about estimated 90 seconds to go through each crossing. There's 10 crossings, and they have to blow it within 15 seconds of each crossing. So okay. it could be a considerable amount of time from the time they blow it at the first crossing to the time they leave town. Right, but you would have eight of them in between the first one and the tenth one. Yeah, it's spread out. Yeah. Yep. So for it's those like living track. along the tracks, I mean, it's going to be repetitive, to say the least, twice a day, five days a week, seven days a week, do we know? 
I think it was mentioned f a minimum of five, not doing weekends. Yeah, at this point it's five days, mm -hmm. but they weren't as specific as to they they weren't going to. It's market driven, so it depends upon if the market explodes and expands. They want wanted the ability to expand without someone saying, "Well, you told us it was only going to be twice right. a day for five days." Okay. Uh, I just think back to what we were originally requested that we learn more from them for any kind of impact on uh, on town residents. Thanks. Thank you. Town Clerk, do you have a report this evening? No. Thank you. Okay, so we are moving into council action. Our first item is the acceptance of resignation uh, from boards and commissions. Um, I have a motion for the uh, resignation from, and I'll do it, it's the same person, three different um, commissions. Uh, it would be Rob Gary resigning from the Historic District Commission, the Flood and Erosion Control, and the Fair Rent, Rent Commission. And all these dates are uh, for all three. It would be uh, September 17th, 2018 to March 31st, 2019. And again, that is for all three of them. I make a motion to accept the resignations. Second. Okay. Any, any discussion? All right, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Um, and would the town clerk please send a letter of thanks to Rob for all of his years of service. Um, next is appointments to boards and commissions. I make a motion to uh, for the Planning and Zoning Commission as an alternate, Lisa C. Murray of 24 Terrywood from 319.19 to 630.22 and to the Board of Building Appeals, Deidre Castoro from um, 81 Center Street from 319.19 to 630.24. Second. Okay, and I think um, her name's Lisa Murphy. Murphy, yes. Yeah, okay. And we have a second? Second. Okay, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? All right, motion carries, thank you. Next, we move into our um, ordinances and resolutions. Do we have a motion on the first one? Make a motion to adopt the certified resolution of the town of Weathersfield authorizing the application for Connecticut Small Cities Community Development Block Grant in an amount not to exceed $1.5 million for improvements to certain properties owned by the Weathersfield Housing Authority. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Um, now, if Peter and George would like to come up um, and make some comments, and then if council members have questions, this would be the forum for us to discuss this. As I, I, again, George Kelly, I'm chair of the uh, Board of Commissioners of the Authority. Uh, I think in my statement in, uh, in favor of this uh, uh, resolution earlier, uh, I summarized at least, I'd certainly be glad to provide any more information that council might need, but summarize the purposes of, uh, of this particular grant. As I said, it's to continue work uh, uh, at the uh, Fuller Senior Housing. Uh, Fuller is a, the converted school that contains 32 units of uh, senior housing. Uh, by law, a certain number of those are available as well to uh, disabled individuals. Uh, and the work, again, is to uh, uh, try to uh, improve uh, the structure and to avoid costs, further costs down the road. Uh, this grant, uh, as I think Peter said earlier, it, it, the grant comes from HUD. The program is administered by the uh, State Department of Housing. And the town uh, uh, agreed, as it has in the past, to apply uh, on behalf of the Housing Authority for this uh, 
uh, for this grant, which certainly goes to precisely the purposes for which this money is set aside by, uh, by the government. Uh, I, I, as I said, we can, we can answer any questions about what is uh, being proposed here, uh, but I hope that gives you a summary, at least, of the work that, that we're hoping to do. Thank you. Councillor uh, Forrest. Thanks. Uh, seems like an almost a no-brainer, of course. You know, the federal government has determined that there's a certain amount of funds that could be available to its citizens and its municipalities to, in order to improve uh, low-income housing, especially for those with disabilities. Um, certainly, uh, the best interest of the town, I feel, for this board would not necessarily to be use $1.5 million of our tax, of our residential tax, but rather from a much larger sum of money that the entire country has, has put into a, a large block grant. So I would approve this authorization to apply for the grant, and I hope it gets put, and I expect it would get put to its best and highest use as it relates to our Weathersfield Housing Authority, and I look forward to improved conditions and uh, a deference of any type of budgetary constraint, uh, budgetary line items that might be in any future of our budget. So it's definitely a fantastic idea, and I wish you guys the best of luck, and I hope that we get $1.5 million. Thank you. Deputy Mayor? Uh, George, just a question. I, I mean, I know that, you know, Fuller, because this is all going to Fuller, mm -hmm. Fuller's been used... Uh, as elderly housing for a long time, I think it goes back to it's when my kids 80s. were still yeah. you know, playing soccer way right. back when. So that was back in the 80s, right? Yep. Have there been any renovations to that building since that time? There has been some work, but... Uh, Minor stuff. Yeah, yeah. So really to bring this thing up to current standards is yeah, it, something this, that everybody wants to do in their own houses, and we should right. look to do it for these people as well. Yeah. I mean, if we don't accept the funds... It's state money, it's our federal money, else. some other town across yeah. the country is going to get it. So if we yeah. don't get it, they don't. I mean, this and is we really to improve the quality of life. Yeah, of if our I own. can, Tony, it's really to uh, Kate Forcier's credit. She has applied uh, very aggressively for the funds that are available uh, last, well, going back several years. But uh, the money is out there. It's, it's going to be provided to somebody. We've been fortunate <clears throat> enough to uh, uh, have the governor approve our applications and uh, as you said the work is uh, necessary and uh, uh, will improve the conditions for the people who are living there thank you and it's certainly not something that we could absorb in our own budget right. so to find these funds yeah. um, in yep. another location are we. huge <laughs> exactly exactly so yep. we appreciate the work that Kate does to look for these and to apply for them um, it's, a, it's a true benefit to the town to have these funds come into our community. Um, Councillor Breton. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, I, um, I also support um, this, uh, the authorizing this, the application of this grant. I think it's, you know, the Weather, Weathersfield Housing Authority, they do a great job of monitoring and, you know, taking care of these houses, and, and they've identified a need, um, and um, a need for improvements, and the block grant is there. And available to help them so I think we should you know we should approve it and also take care of the people in the town who need it thank you anybody else Councilor Latina can you identify what some of the pressing issues are in that building that would be fixed by the use of this money yeah sure, you want me to go ahead okay. yeah. sure. yes the uh, the current uh, the grant the proposed grant uh, we'll go in to uh, connect the existing, uh, to make sidewalks to connect the uh, rear doors and rear pads, uh, bituminous uh, pads with concrete walkways. Concrete is now, uh, we're obligated to put concrete as opposed to bituminous uh, uh, concrete, just regular concrete. Uh, so there'll be sidewalks installed, uh, rear entrance doors. We'll paint the ceilings, replace interior door units. They'll be replacing flooring that won't get done this time. Uh, hot water heaters, baseboard heat, uh, HVAC mini splits, exterior unit and site lighting, uh, smoke detectors, sprinkler heads, emergency light indicator panel, sinks, tubs and surrounds, grab bars, medicine cabinets, kitchen and bath exhaust fans and emergency call system and we're replacing the electrical panels. So that's what we'll be doing with this, this amount of money. But there is also, as I understand it, a, uh, 
uh, serious deterioration uh, to some of the concrete slabs, uh, which were fine when it was a school, but they'd now been uh, rusted by, by the in-floor heating system that was used at the time when it was a school. And it's work that, uh, you know, in order to, to maintain the building going forward, uh, that, that also has to be done. So for that vulnerable population, I'm hearing that these fixes are necessary for their safety? Safety and overall benefit, yes, yeah. Thank you. And, and I would also point out that uh, uh, the operation of, of the housing authority uh, itself is a requirement of state law. I mean, this is something I would hope the town would do anyway, but as it is, uh, we are required to provide a certain amount of, uh, of, of affordable housing to uh, uh, those in need. That's what we're doing here, and, and we're hoping to uh, secure, ensure their safety, the residents' safety going forward, and, uh, and to improve conditions. Thank you. Anybody else? Also, uh, Kate has uh, told me since we've been successful in the last few years, we've got James Devlin, uh, we've got these two uh, complexes along with this one if it's awarded, uh, will go a long way to helping and to sustaining these units and these complexes for the next 20 years. This should be the last one, Kate said. We have done all we could do in uh, renovating the existing uh, housing that we have, public housing that we have. So she figures that this might be uh, one of the last ones. Thank you. Any other council comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any uh, opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, motion carries, thank you. Um, next, we have um, we need a motion for the resolution of the town of Wethersfield establish, establishing um, a program income reuse plan. Yes, Mayor. I make a motion to adopt a resolution of the town of Wethersfield establishing a program income reuse plan from CDBG assisted activities. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Would you gentlemen like to speak to this? Yeah, I'll say a few words. A uh, gentleman asked about the program income, what's going to be used for basically the uh, scope of work that I've just stated. Uh, program income will be part of that total grant allocation. We are obligated to spend program income because we have more than 25000 in the town. We have to spend that before we can even start spending the uh, grant uh, allocation if awarded. And what is that number? Is that 25000 Is that yeah, what you said is the number? We're putting uh, about $63,000 of program income money that has been collected by recapturing uh, loans that are out there for the housing rehab program many years ago. Uh, we'll be using that money in conjunction with the one point five to make the to um, pay for these renovations. Okay. Are there any council questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. And we have a, re um, a resolution for the use of program income. Councilor Forrest? I'd like to move to adopt a resolution for the use of program in income. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. And Peter, would you like to speak to this as well? Or is this in conjunction with the last item? It is. Okay. Any council comments or questions? Councilor Lester? Ask why we need is a separate, why are we doing a separate motion? And is, is it the same thing? I'm, I'm trying to follow this from the previous resolution. Other right, were, right. And I'm not sure I do. Gary, honest. can you speak to that or Peter? Well, uh, the first motion was uh, to for establish the program, and this is to use it. Okay. Yeah. Yes. One is to establish a program income reuse plan. This one is for the use of the program income. All right. I'd love to see it in one motion, but that's gotcha. all right. <laughs> You'll Any have other? to speak to your lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Rell, did you have a question? Yes. Um, 
I'm just to make sure we're on the same item number B3A. Is that the item number? No, we're on um, B1C3. B1C3. Maybe jumping ahead of myself. Okay. Um, no, I don't have. I just had a question. There was somewhere on here about the RFP, and I'm sorry if I've missed it already. No, that, yeah, that's nope. Okay. Yeah, that's. I'm ahead of myself. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. You. It's all tied. <laughs> it is a little confusing. Yeah, there's five. I think five motions on this tonight. Okay. Uh, any other comments or questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. The motion carries. Um, the last item we have is the 2018 Small Cities Grant Discussion, and I believe there's no action required on that. We just had to have a uh, public hearing so that we could speak to last year's um, grant. Is that a, That's correct. Is that right? Okay. If we have an ongoing grant, it has to be discussed in this public hearing for the next grant. Okay, very well. Um, are there any council members that have any, any comments to make on the 2018 Small Cities Grant discussion? Councilor Latina. So you had mentioned earlier that certain things were accomplished with that grant already. Is there any way that maybe we could get some photos or just see how the work came out? Actually, uh, the bids are due on Wednesday. So this has not started yet, the 2018. We do have a scope of work, and I can go over that, but the bids are due on Wednesday, I think at 2 o'clock or something like that. So we haven't started it yeah. yet. Gotcha. I'm ahead of myself. The wheels of federal and state funding grind fairly slowly. <laughs> Sadly, yes. Thank you. Any other comments or questions, Councilor Rell? How much was that for, for the 2018? That was $800,000. Okay. And did we receive that 800000 Yes, already? we did. Okay. And we added um, a little bit of program income along with that as well. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Councilor Forrest? Quickly, just wanted to encourage you. Uh, thank you for all of the efforts that you've done so far, sincerely. Encourage you to continue to apply for not only the grants that we certainly look for today, but any other grants which you might be able to, to identify. I'm sure you understand that confines or the construct upon which we're living today and especially from a governmental agency and to uh, encourage you to continue to bring positive grants to our table that we can approve more of them to, for the betterment of our community thank you thank you thank you gentlemen I appreciate you. your information and your time tonight okay um, we have no matters of unfinished business, so now we will move into other business. Selection of the consultant for the Small Cities Community Development Block Grant Project 2019. Do I have a motion? I make a motion to retain community consulting as grant administrator for the 2019 Small Cities Community Development Block Grant application and project and for administration of the program income reuse plan. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Mr. Town Manager? Sure, the Connecticut Department of Housing requires that grant recipients for these funds retain services of a certified grant administrator to ensure that the small cities grant uh, continues to meet requirements of both the state and federal regulations that are associated with these funds. We went out to a request for proposals back in January and the town of Wethersfield uh, solicited proposals for the consulting firm, in this case Community Consulting, who has provided grant administration services for the town over the last 10 years or so, uh, was the uh, was the respond the only respondent. Um, his requests for funds are in line with federal guidelines, and his company has a successful history of uh, managing these funds not only for the town but throughout the state of Connecticut. Um, and just as a side note, uh, because it, it's kind of been kicked around, his fee is actually coming directly from the grant, so there's no cost to the city or to the uh, to the town uh, taxpayers. Hey, are there any questions? All right, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next, we have the insurance agent of record. Do I have a motion? Councilor Forrest? Motion to reappoint Chris Monroe of USI Insurance as the town's agent of record for employee benefits insurance. 
Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Town manager? Sure. Uh, per the town code of ordinances, the agent of record for insurance is up for a three-year term. It is appointed by the town manager and subject to the approval of the council. The insurance commission has recommended, and I support the reappoint appointment of the agent of record for employee benefits. Are there any comments or questions? Councilor Forrest. Uh, just as the liaison for, from the insurance committee, the insurance committee was extremely excited to be able to continue this particular contract. The contract actually stays level, so there's absolutely no increase from the previous three-year contract. And I believe over about a nine-year term ballpark, the increase has been about 3% over nine years. So the terms are extremely reasonable. And just uh, as someone who sits in on that committee, and maybe Councillor Spinella can talk even before my time on the insurance committee, Chris Monroe, uh, brings a level of professionalism and background and knowledge that um, is extremely competent is a is a nice way to put it and is, is the lowest way to put it and is probably expert is probably one of the highest uh, accolades i can say for him in this particular position he's clear concise uh, about what how he's bringing very some very complicated procedures regarding insurance although it can be very dry i think is a nice way to put it but he um, he's really, in my impression, he is really looking out for the best interests of our town, our ability to try to drive down our costs, and he answers all of the questions from the entire committee with thoughtfulness. So that's my impression over the last uh, year or so. I've seen the committee work. I've seen him work with the committee, and it certainly seems like a good way moving forward. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Councilor Latina? Matt, can you tell me when the last time the insurance committee did some sort of search for this position? I cannot. I've only been on the committee a year and a half, and it seems like there are multiple three-year terms. These are just the facts that I was told. Do we know? Yeah. Is there yeah. a, a policy that we need yeah. to be following? Or? Yeah. Yeah. They, um, they, well, and I think they merged. USI wasn't er the original recipient, but uh, they went out to bid for a contract period covering 2013 to 2016, and then the insurance commission recommended an extension uh, to this point. So, so I think we can extend without having to go to RFP uh, at this point, and I'm only two weeks in. But I believe your your procurement policy allows you to provide that extension. Okay. And this is another three year term. Correct. This would actually be for a three year term. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. We have another insurance agent motion. I'd like to move to reappoint Chris War Wardrop of USI Insurance as the town's agents of record for liability, auto property, and workers' compensation insurance. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Mr. Town Manager? Certainly. Uh, again, very similar. The Weathersfield Code of Ordinances allows or uh, requires that the agent of record for insurance is for a three-year term appointed by the town manager and again subject to the approval of council in this case the insurance commission has recommended and i support the reappointment of the agent of record for liability auto property and workers compensation this one was also bid out in 2016. this one i'm assuming uh, <laughs> this one was actually bid uh, 2013. okay was when the last RFP was issued for this one. Okay. Are there any comments or questions? Councilor Forrest. Same comments as before. It's uh, the um, cost is being held flat. Uh, the insurance, uh, the insurance committee had the same accolades, and I've seen the same uh, back and forth thoughtfulness with both Chris's. So the same concept applies, and it um, some of his. Thoughtfulness and being able to return money from various KERMA plans and various pools of money I've been impressed with, although I've only been on the committee for a little over a year now. Uh, but I do think he's working in our best interest. So my uh, recommendation would be to approve. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, motion carries. Uh, next, we have um, the approval of the 2019 tax suspense list. Do I have a motion? Motion to accept the 2019 tax suspense list. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, and I see we have the tax collector, Marlene, in the audience. Would you come on up to answer any questions we might have? 
Mr. Town Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and so this agenda item originates from the tax collector's office, so I'll, I'll let her go into it, but just quickly, the town is requesting authorization to transfer the uncollected taxes uh, from individuals that we can no longer, or are no longer in business and are within the suspense system, and I think Marlene could probably elaborate better than I. Yes, good evening. Um, these are businesses that are no longer around. A lot of the LLCs have been closed. We have been checking them on the state website, looking them up and doing the research. These accounts were also turned over to our collection agency and they came back with the same response. Um, they're not able to be collectible. They're not being written off. They're just being put in suspense so they will no longer appear in our collectible. So at time like now when we're trying to budget, they don't show up in the number. We're trying to see what would be there to get for next year's budget. Okay, thank you. Are there any comments or questions? Councilor Lesser. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, hi, Marlene. Hi. Uh, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit of how much this relates to like last year's amount is the first question. And the second question, I understand it being in suspense. Do we have any chance to collect any of this money though? So those are the two questions. Yes, when something is in suspense, there is always a chance that it could be collected because we have placed UCC liens. Okay. So if any of these individuals try to reopen these businesses or reopen the LLCs, they will not be able to do that unless these debts get paid. Okay. Um, the you. list is a little bit different from last year because we had cars last year that were all deceased. These are all strictly businesses. So this year I've shifted the focus to the businesses to try to clean them up. You know, in terms of a dollar number, where this 211 is it higher than last year? Yes, lower because the cars were weren't not near this amount. So it's much higher. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you, Councillor Latina. Who do we use for our uh, collection agency? They just changed their name. Um, it, they're out of Rhode Island. I can get you the information. They just changed the name, and I don't want to say it wrong because it's a, a spin on words, kind of their new name. Does the um, collection agency have the ability to find out if one of these LLCs has now reappeared under a different name? I can check with them to see if they can do that. There was a, a large number on one of the businesses that closed, and I'm under the impression they've opened up under another LLC, so it might be worth looking. Okay. All right. I will do that. Thank you. Anything else, counselors? Councilor Forrest. Thank you, Mayor. Are we required to use this particular collection agency, or is that, is that some type of a contract we have? Do we, have we ever used multiple in order to try to collect debts, et cetera? This is the only one we've ever used, as long as I've been here. Um, I, it, I believe it's an open-end thing. I don't think we're tied into a contract. Um, have you, have there, has there been any consideration, I guess, first of all, for using someone from the state of Connecticut, uh, a collection agency or collection attorneys? Uh, well, we actually had a bunch of them come in here, and we interviewed them, and we chose them because they had the higher rate. A return versus uh, there were a few that were in town but they were more into real estate and we don't use a collection agency for real estate but we can go out certainly go out to look again okay thank you any other comments or questions seeing none all in favor aye, aye. 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 any opposed any abstentions motion carries thank, thank you. you Marlene thank you uh, next we're moving to bids the first one is a diesel gas bid do I have a motion Yes, Mayor. Uh, I make a motion to award the, the CRCOG bid number 683 to the Dime Oil Company at a cost of $2.22 per gallon for diesel fuel. Do we have a second? Councilor Forrest? Second, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mr. Town Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is an annual event the town locks in the rates for diesel on an annual basis and in this particular case we're piggybacking on the council of uh cannot the council of government's bid which was for two dollars and 22 cents per gallon uh, this is an award to dime oil company as their bid was the lowest price any questions deputy mayor uh, I'm, I'm looking at this and i'm assuming that this is town only before we used to provide the diesel for the schools when they had an arrangement with the bus company that they get the fuel. Does the bus company contract have them get their own fuel now where they don't use this? Just curious. Because in the past it always said town and board. I apologize. I don't know uh, the answer to that question, but I will find out and get back to you. I would think if they're contracting out to autumn busing that the Diesel would be paid for with the buses, but because I think we didn't we just pay for the the um, 
athletic buses. Now, with the firm before, we also provided them oh. with the diesel, too. Right. That's, okay. what, that's my only concern. That this doesn't eliminate them if it should be in there. Yeah, I'll have to find out for you and get back okay. to you. I'll get back to the council on that question. Thank you. That sounds like comparable for the town side, but the I town don't think side. It, yeah. it doesn't include for buses. Right. That's why I just wanted to be sure we're not shortchanging. Sure. I'll check. Okay, anything else? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Next is Cedar Street Playscape replace replacement bid. Do we have a motion? Councilor Forrest? I move to award the purchase of the replacement playscape at Farms Village Park on Cedar Street to Creative Recreation of Newington, Connecticut at a cost of $74,421. We have a second? Second. Okay, and I see Kathy Bagley in the audience. Did you want to make opening comments? I tell me you know what? In this case, I will only because I go back to my community development route. Uh, so uh, as you may recall, the town needed to remove the old playscape, which I'll allow if Kathy wants to go into that, she can. But due to its condition, and what I really like and appreciate about this is it goes back to a real grassroots community development effort. Uh, she engaged town residents in the process. It wasn't just big bad government coming in and saying we're putting in a new playscape here. So I, I just wanted to touch upon that, that I actually thought that was a great way to proceed uh, and, and bring engagement to the table. So with that, I'll Thank let you. you do the rest. Yep, this is a replacement playscape at Farms Village Playground, which everybody knows is Cedar Street Playground. Um, the, other, the original playscape has been removed and um, we got budgeted for it in this year's capital improvement program. And we did have a parents meeting of the neighborhood back in um, the fall to kind of get an idea of what they would like to see on the playground. And um, we went off the state bid list. Okay, very good. Any comments or questions? When will it be ready? <laughs> <laughs> It's a six to eight week ordering process. So we would, if it's approved tonight, we would get that order in tomorrow. And our goal is to get it in in time for the summer. Thank you. Very good. Anything else from council? Councilor Rell? Thank you, Kathy. Um, just a couple quick questions. How long had the playscape been there prior to you know, it deteriorating beyond use? I believe it was installed. We went back and looked. I think it was in 1991. Okay. It was one of the first playscapes when I came to town that we put in. So it, it was, we got, our, we got our money's worth out of it. Just to maybe not remind you, but let you know, I was a junior in high school in 1991, so it's not that long ago. <laughs> um, so we, yeah, we definitely got our money's worth for that. How, is there a guarantee or is there a uh, lifespan on... Um, this current playscape i know it's much different this is made of synthetic materials compared to what the the previous one was do we have a an idea how long they these typically last for they they generally last um usually you can do 10 to 15 years a little bit of it just depends on how the wear and tear is but okay. they're all part of a we all we have a um a robust playground inspection program so we keep an eye on things and we we stay on top of it so that we the staff does good maintenance on it um, without going too deep into the specs on it I got to ask uh, what kind of material will be underneath the playscape this will be the uh, wood chips the safety surfacing okay that's it. And I guess one other question. Have we used these guys before? I know we've done uh, behind Emerson is new, behind Webb is new, relatively new. Both Two are, new ones behind Emerson, I guess, are new ones. Both are creative recreation. Okay, same company. Yes. And they've done good work. They stand by everything. They, yeah, they, anytime we have an issue, that's one of the things we liked about them. They come out, they work with us, and then we determine how we move forward with whatever repair we need to do. And they're a state-approved contractor? So yes. I think we get a discount. A we do, amount. yes. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, seeing nothing. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? 
Motion carries. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. Next, we have police headquarters UPS upgrade. Do I have a motion? Make a motion to approve the purchase of two uninterruptible power supply units for police headquarters for $51,466. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, and I see Officer Gove in the audience. Are you speaking on this? If you'd like me to. <laughs> Mr. Town Manager? <laughs> Sure, why not? Uh, <laughs> thank you, Mayor. Actually, I'll do a quick intro, So, in, and, and you can elaborate, Officer Gove, when you get a chance. But uh, in evalu evaluating the condition of the public safety equipment, it was determined that a number of the town's uninterruptible power supplies, or UPS units, have reached their life expectancy. And these are units that run 24-7, 365. And this, these two, I believe, have been online since 2003. Um, so due to the age of the equipment, you have issues with the replacement parts. Um, which are limited, if not impossible to get. And I think, and you can explain a little bit their usage, but I believe they cover dispatch operations. So they're one of those critical components that you don't want to necessarily lose power on at any time. Yes, okay. that is correct. Good evening and thank you. Um, these two UPSs, they have been in service since 2003 through constant maintenance. Uh, we've, we've brought them this long. And in technology, we're talking about 16 years. That's quite some time. Um, the town manager is correct that the availability of parts is now limited at best. They don't make circuit boards for these, and through the notes, um, I don't know if you read, but we did experience a failure at one point in time of a circuit board of a UPS. We're hoping to not uh, experience that again. These units power our dispatch center. They power both server closets and all networking inside the building. So as these units are online should we receive any sort of power surge which is relatively common in, in Weathersfield. Uh, these units take over until the generators uh, fire or the generator fires up. So any interruption would bring down our communications, our ability to receive phone calls uh, and dispatch our officers uh, at least for a short time being and we want to mitigate any sort of issues with that. Okay, are there any council questions? And how many units are in the police department now? There are two, and each unit has an additional battery cabinet attached to it. Okay. Anything else, council? Okay, seeing no questions, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed, any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank, Thank you, you for coming tonight. Okay, we have no ordinances or, resol or resolutions for introduction, so we will move into the minutes. Do I have a motion for the February 19th regular meeting? Motion to approve minutes of February 19th, 2019 regular meeting. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, are there any um, changes or corrections to those minutes? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, motion carries. Next. We have the meeting minutes of March 4th. Do I have a motion? Make a motion to approve the meeting minutes of March 4th, 2019. Second. Okay. Are there any changes or corrections to these meeting minutes? Seeing none, all. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, Madam Mayor, I just noticed, like, just on the present absent, uh, the absent lit seems to be the names all the way to the right, and the present seems to be <laughs> all the way to the left. It looks like it. it it looks like it could be, I think it's only one individual, but it looks like it could be an illegal meeting, which of course is not true. Um, so it might just be easier if you, if it were re-appropriated so that the present were all on one side yeah. and the absent were all on the other. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Councilman Latina, are you abstaining? Uh, yeah, sure. I'm sorry, I can't remember anything. So if I wasn't here, I wasn't here, and I apologize. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, we will move back into public comments. Members of the public have five minutes to speak. Is there anybody who'd like to speak tonight? Mr. Mazzarella. Good evening, Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walker Hill Road. Just a couple quick observations, comments. Uh, the Board of Ed budget presentation, 
I uh, would take an exception to the front page of that where they are inferring that their budget is being reduced by 2.68%. We all know that's not the case. A huge amount of money has been transferred over to town, um, to the town side. Now it becomes your problem instead of their problem. I hope you can manage some of those items much more efficiently than the board has in the past. Particular, uh, particularly, I'm interested in the energy consumption at the high school. Uh, that had been brought up by Mr. Emmett several times over the last, since the high school went online. Um, I questioned the demand for all that power. I questioned whether it was actual usage or just money. Um, you know, we heard that the building's being utilized much more now. We also heard that during the renovations, it was state-of-the-art electrical facility system-wide uh, uh, lighting improvements and energy efficiency. So uh, where's all electricity going? I, I think uh, we could spend some money on doing a study of that. Uh, be well worth it. Um, I'd also uh, urge all of you to dig deep into the Board of Ed budget line by line um, to make sure that you know what's being transferred over to you is, is real. Uh, it sure doesn't look it from from the observations of that PowerPoint presentation. Um, the other comment I had was uh, regarding the uh, Weathersfield Housing Authority and uh, they've been doing a lot of work over the last uh, several years on the various housing, um, I don't want to call them projects, but areas. Um, I happen to live in close proximity to uh, Lancaster. Matter of fact, I went to school at Lancaster. So I have a few years on Mr. Rell over there with the <laughs> 1991. What the heck is that all about? <laughs> I was there in 63. <laughs> Anyways, uh, um, yeah, they've done a lot of work on the uh, exterior of the houses, uh, the areas I go by. However, I question some of the uh, maintenance in the exterior. The yards uh, are not always well kept. I'm not sure if the housing authority is supposed to maintain those or the tenants are supposed to maintain those, but I'd like to see something done about that. And we all have to take care of our lawns and keep things tidy and nice looking. And uh, I think uh, even people that are uh, you know less fortunate than us, they they should have to do the same, or the housing authority should do the same. Um, I see cars parked on the lawns over there that is against the town ordinance and uh, I don't think anybody does anything about it. So yeah, okay, spend some money and fix up the interiors, but let's enforce the rules or modify the rules uh, to have it look nice from the outside. So it's part of the community. Um, the other comment I wanted to make was about the public hearings. Uh, this gentleman was up here and uh, probably hasn't been involved with the town meetings as much um, and how they work, but at a, at a public hearing, it's very difficult for the public to ask questions and get answers, and uh, you people had the opportunity to ask some questions and get some answers, but the public only had opportunity to make a statement. So I, I assume that meets the legal requirements of a public hearing. Um, I think this individual was more than willing to have a conversation with the public and he wasn't allowed to do so. So I just hope we're doing everything proper. And uh, as uh, Mr. Young pointed out, the agenda uh, you know, just gives us a little blurb of what we're talking about, and uh, it would be nice if that could be expanded. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mazzarella. Mr. Colantonio?
um, the full agenda packet is available online. It's not available in print here, but it is available online, and all the items were are discussed in that full packet. We haven't started your timer yet. That's Don't okay. worry. <laughs> Go ahead, Gus. I got all the time in the world, you know. I'm, <laughs> I don't work anymore, but I just a couple comments, I guess. You know, Councilor Forrest uh, says that uh, one and a half million dollars is free money. Free money, it's a grant, yeah, but uh, there is no such thing like free money. Remember something, too, that uh, basically government doesn't have any money until it takes it from the, the people, unless they print it and then the inflation goes up. There is no such thing like free money. We have $22 trillion worth of debt because of that sentiment, because of that philosophy. I heard today something that uh, in certain section of the, the states, every year they have to really spend whatever they have allocated for them for that particular year. Otherwise, they will not be able to have the same thing the following year. So neither or not, they get rid of it. And that's not right. But that's the mentality of government. One and a half million dollars, 32 units, $50,000 plus or minus for each unit. It's a lot of freaking money. I don't know what we're doing with it. $50,000. If I had $50,000 to spend in my house, I would make it a castle. And we're talking about air conditioning, about this and that. It's a lot of money. Are we using the money properly? Like Mozzarella says, you know, says, you know the, the, the outskirts of this housing authority or the... Uh, they don't keep it uh, the way they should. I mean, you know, they get breaks here and there, and then they don't even do anything at all. What do we get in return? Is there any accountability for these people? Maybe not. I don't know. But I know for a fact that every year, again, the taxes keep on going up. And it's not, not necessarily that one and a half million dollars come from this town, but I'm sure that that money comes from the taxpayers of the United States. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colantonio. Anybody else like to speak tonight? Mr. Young? Good evening again, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Um, I didn't, I didn't expect you to vote against the 1.5 million, because I know all of your people. You never pass, down, pass up a, a chance to spend money, especially someone else's money, and borrowed money at that. You're really good at spending borrowed money. I've said, many, and it was mentioned that there's there supposed to be two public hearings on this issue. I believe I've spoken other ones or another one regarding this, which I still objected to any of that spending. And I've also said in the past that some of those houses that, we, that the housing authority owns sh should be uh, taken down and made into open space. We like open space in Wethersfield. And what do we get out of having those shacks from the housing authority even here? I see no benefit. I get no benefit. I get the bill. Talking about bill, with the presentation given by the Board of Education earlier tonight, uh, I noticed that they're, they're increasing. And it's small money, but everything is small. There's a lot of small money that ends up equaling piles of money. That they, the coaching stipends. How much is that stop, uh, coaching stipends that they have in their budget at this point? Last year it was 800 and some thousand dollars. I think they call it extra pay. And it just keeps growing. Ten years ago it was 400 and some thousand. And now, if I recall correctly, last year it was in the eights or $900,000 range. Everything just keeps edging up and edging up, and it's all part of the budget. And as we see on their screens, oh, it increased by $10,000. Show us what the, the real number was and then the increase. That might really inset in some people's minds, especially yours, that there's a lot of money there and they want more. They want constantly more. But now 
Now they want another $23,000, $29,000 for lacrosse stipends. And then, of course, they mentioned they got to buy equipment. And it wasn't long ago we didn't have lacrosse. That sort of snuck right in. Us citizens watched it come in. We, we said no. And it still came in and popped up, and, and now it's in our budget. And it started out by private people. Private people who started something, and bang, it pops up, and it ends up in the town's budget. Is that the way we do things? Of course, that's the way Weathersfield does things. Uh, I think someone asked the superintendent about the average, average salaries, and he said it was 12.8% above the average. That's, that's tremendous, 12.5%. You know, we all know the economy hasn't been good, but we haven't been planning for the downfalls. And we've gone through downfalls, and we have more coming. And then I think someone had said tonight about the grants for the 32 units, the money is out there. The money is out there, so we may as well grab it. It's out there, all right. It's out in someone else's pockets, and, you're, and they're going to, in order to get your grant, you got to go take it from somebody or borrow it. And this is how these people, these people think. You know, we have this $63,000 in program income you spoke about tonight that was left over. Why did, 63000 is a lot of money. Why not fix and forget the 1.5? Why not raise the rents and make it, make it into a business? Make it profitable. Make it, make it pay for itself instead of making everybody else pay for it. Because that's really what you're doing. You're making the rest of us who have no interest, no, no concern whatsoever about supporting this, and you're making us pay for it. And it goes on to project after project. Like I say, there's a lot of internal life programs created right here. And, and, and it's, it's, it's ruining us. It's, it's sending us right down the tubes, folks. And uh, you're the drivers. You're the drivers. Your names are all out there for when we go down to, down the tubes. Thank you very much, madam. I'll be back Thank next you. week. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak this evening? Come on up, Mr. Mill. Paul Mill, only 52 Livingston Street, Weathersfield. I, I meant to say this before, but... Uh, um, I went to the meet and greet, and I thought that was a great idea. That's where I met Gary, and we had a, a long conversation there. He was conversing with other people about projects, and um, it got my hopes up for Weathersfield because there's the other side where we can attract some things and do some um, cooperation and, and get, some more, get, get some more taxes coming in. Um, um, and he had, he had a lot of things just tripped right off his tongue that he had worked with, and he seemed like the guy who's going to get the job done. I'm really, I'm really glad you came on board, Gary, that they picked you. Um, around the corner from me, um, 341 Jordan Lane is a Metaplex building. If it fell off your radar or not. It's it on took, the radar. <laughs> okay. It took, it took uh, it's fine, but it, it'd be, it's an opportunity you know, maybe for some required housing or whatever. It's a, it's a great opportunity there. I live near Northeast Utilities. It used to be Northeast and now it's a magnet school. What a, what a great job there. Um, I don't know what benefits we get other than that other than providing a great education. It's got solar, it's, uh, it's um, environmentally designed with rain gardens and such. But um, I, I'm pretty hopeful after meeting Gary and seeing come on board that we can see the one I mentioned, and the other projects on the other end of Silas Dean that uh, we've been working on. So, thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that'd like to speak tonight? Okay, seeing nobody, we'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. Sir? <laughs> Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? Motion carries.